Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so I just wanted to speak uh, a little bit uh, about uh, really first my interpretation um, of the events of 2016, uh, Trump election, uh, populism more generally. I'll, I'll make some very brief comments on the impact of that on foreign policy uh, and then maybe try to lay out uh, potential alternatives for the future uh, of U.S. politics. Uh, with respect to uh, Trump's election, um, and I think what, what could be what is often called populism, um, to me, I think uh, we really need to think about it. Uh, the underlying cause of it is the, the failure of the post-Cold War policy consensus, uh, which has failed to deliver on um, most of its promises and which really opened the path for someone like Trump uh, who ran fundamentally, if not entirely, as a critic um, of the bipartisan consensus of both parties uh, on the major issue, uh, major issue since the end of the Cold War. He never really um, fully articulated any uh, fully fledged solutions to these problems. Um, he still hasn't after several years of office, but um, more than any of his opponents, he was able to acknowledge uh, serious changes uh, and challenges that were facing the United States um, and many people uh, that no one else um, was really willing to acknowledge. And I think it's worth exploring some of these uh, in, a bit, in a bit more detail. The foreign policy failures uh, at this point are, are pretty well known and, and widely acknowledged. Um, it is important to recall that uh, in things like Iraq, uh, and Libya, really the conventional leaderships of both parties um, were implicated. Uh, and, and Trump uh, used that very aggressively uh, against both opponents, Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton. Um, but to that list, you could also add some things that are less frequently spoken of, such as the mismanagement of Russia in the 1990s, and um, as is becoming more and more evident every day, the mismanagement of North Korea in the 1990s. Probably more important, um, although also more complex and controversial and difficult to define than the foreign policy issues, however, are the economic uh, problems and new economic situation uh, that the United States is facing. Uh, the essential issue is that we have, on the one hand, um, severely widening inequality, uh, and at the same time, we have slow and historically low productivity growth. And this is a particularly toxic combination um, as the usual rationale for widening inequality is uh, more growth, more innovation, uh, absolute standards of, of living improvement, even though um, people are relatively less equal. Uh, but that has not been happening. Instead, what we have seen is actually uh, a larger and larger gap between corporate profits and larger GDP growth, benefiting a smaller and smaller number of uh, large capital holders. We have stagnant wages. We have low investment, both in things like research and development, uh, as well as general corporate capital expenditures. Um, essentially, the entire world is in an undeclared currency war. Uh, and a race to the bottom, uh, not only on wages, but uh, in, in regulations, labor standards, taxation, tax, uh, tax enforcement, uh, and many other areas. And uh, at this point, it's become clear, or at least become the position of many people, that this system, which we, is, the conscious, is the result of conscious political choices uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, including things like financial deregulation, um, the essential focus of our trade policy, that this system has really only benefited the uh, most egregious abusers of it, uh, namely China uh, and namely um, companies that, and, and individuals that participate um, in, in some of the uh, most uh, uh, problematic or uh, uh, negative, counterproductive behavior um, 
of, of the sort of capitalist system as opposed to the proper allocation uh, of capital that is supposed to be the hallmark of it and the justification of private ownership, what you're actually seeing is uh, stockpiling of cash on corporate balance sheets. You're seeing capital flowing in the reverse direction that trade theory would predict uh, and the areas that are most in need uh, of new investment are actually uh, unable to receive it. On top of all these issues, uh, the, neither, neither party uh, has really been able to comprehend uh, or offer any coherent solutions to them. The right's typical remedies for economic issues, uh, including lower taxes, deregulation, more free markets, etc., uh, will at best uh, solve few of our problems, um, which, as I said, seem fundamentally more grounded in the current incentives of the capitalist system uh, as it's been designed since the uh, end of the Cold War, rather than in too large of a state or too high taxes, etc. And solving problems domestically in the U.S., whether it is a sensible health care system, better infrastructure, more funding of research for innovation, um, perhaps even negotiating uh, better currency agreements and trade policies with other countries, these situations um, will require, if anything, a more activist role for the state and not less. The left, on the other hand, suffers from a different problem where the right um, basically is confused about reality uh, and no longer is really offering any solutions um, that address core problems or which have already been discredited, um, for example, monetarist, monetary policy, etc. The left is sort of conflicted by uh, competing or contradictory versions of egalitarianism. Uh, and in particular, uh, this, this manifests itself on, on, again, the role of the state. On the one hand, the left typically wants high minimum wages, um, but they also want unlimited illegal immigration. The two of these things um, cannot really coexist. They want high taxes, but also open borders. In addition, another change has taken place where from the perspective, the usual perspective of left-right, where the right um, is seeking to preserve the status quo and the left is revolutionary, the Democratic Party in the U.S. has effectively come to represent the affluent uh, and, and the status quo. And any serious attempt to implement the sort of redistributionist program that uh, far-left members of the party, such as Bernie Sanders, might want would fundamentally place it in conflict with its largest donors in Silicon Valley and on Wall Street. Beneath all of this, in my opinion, uh, is really a fundamental failure uh, in both, both our intellectual life and our policy um, to come to terms with or comprehend the role of the nation state today. Uh, for the right, the state is effectively uh, a restrictor of freedom, an inhibitor of markets, of individual wealth accumulation, um, something that needs to be overcome, minimized. On the other hand, for the left, the nation state has effectively come to represent a, uh, a legacy of racism, oppression, conflict, etc. The problem is that however much neither ideology might want the nation state, we still live in a world of nation states. Uh, national institutions are still the main means that we have for dealing with not only foreign policy, but also um, major issues of economic policy, the welfare state, etc. And in particular, uh, our national governments and institutions are at this point the only democratic institutions uh, that we have. So to weaken national sovereignty is also to weaken democracy. And unless we can provide a positive role for the nation state, both in political and cultural and economic life, um, we are fundamentally going to have uh, significant problems in dealing with the mismatch between our economic institutions uh, and our political institutions. And uh, at this point, I think that Trump basically raised the challenge of should we revive, strengthen, uh, 
the national government, the nation state uh, as an entity, its role in both economic and cultural issues uh, or not. And at the very least, I think that that question has, uh, it wasn't really thought about by the other parties and it remains to be really answered. Uh, obviously, uh, this has significant implications in the foreign policy arena. I will be uh, relatively brief here, but just a few observations as I think uh, they're important. The first is, I think um, there has been a lot of uh, commentary, criticism, concern as to whether uh, the Trump administration um, will maintain the U.S. in general's commitment to alliances to uh, what is often called the world order or the liberal international order uh, and so on. And I think to some extent Trump has become a kind of convenient um, scapegoat for some of these issues. That is not to say that some of his rhetoric uh, has not been counterproductive and unfortunate, but at the same time, even if he doesn't make any of these problems better, uh, for the most part, he did not create them. And fundamentally, we need to ask ourselves, uh, is the U.S. stronger today uh, relative to China, Russia, Iran, North Korea than it was 25 years ago? I think the answer is pretty obvious. <clears throat> and uh, the reality is that um, if the world order is going to deteriorate, it's not because someone failed to give a speech uh, in which they use the phrase uh, 400 times. It's because the fundamental nations that are the pillars of this order have been undermined by our own poor policy choices. Uh, on that point, I think, again, coming back to the role of the nation state with respect to international relations, um, we have moved from a sense of the world order as the cooperation of independent nation states on shared national interests to an, an, an idea of positing uh, the world order as a sort of end in itself, as a representation of an abstract moral uh, sort of goal that either does not recognize or does not acknowledge the legitimacy of uh, separate national interests. And again, this is a problem both in terms of the domestic legitimacy of American and other politicians uh, who have to, as democratic leaders, explain to their constituencies why they are pursuing the policies that they are doing. And if they are not allowed to speak in terms of national interests, uh, then this order becomes very hypocritical uh, and very unstable. And incidentally, I think also even in between states, when we think of the world order in terms of whether countries are good actors or bad actors, uh, it leaves very, very little room for compromise uh, and cooperation, whereas on the basis of national interest, there actually may be um, more opportunity for that. So returning then to the future um, of, of U.S. politics, uh, as I said at the beginning, I think Trump, in his own uh, vague, blustery way, did manage to recognize the significant challenges that uh, the, the post-Cold War consensus uh, faces, both domestically and internally in the United States and in terms of foreign policy. Um, but he still actually has not had any real positive agenda for addressing these. And uh, after eight months uh, in office, I don't think you can characterize the administration as anything but uh, chaotic and incompetent. Uh, and oftentimes counterproductive even on its own stated goals. I think that uh, you know, a lot of attention has been paid to uh, Trump and also to people like Steve Bannon. And I think this emphasis is actually uh, misguided. Um, Bannon and Trump both, I think, recognized uh, the opportunity uh, the electoral opportunity they could exploit by running against the status quo. Um, but neither of them really had a concept of how to change it in terms of the policies that would be necessary or in terms of building a, uh, the political coalition that would be effective, uh, which would have to include 
uh, parts of the left, as well as parts of the business uh, community and corporate elite. Uh, and I think really it's perhaps not surprising um, that a, a, uh, an administration that from the beginning misunderstood its appeal um, hasn't been able to graduate from the sort of campaigning and Breitbart bomb throwing uh, in order to actually govern. Now there have been some developments in, in recent days, very recently, that uh, suggest uh, that maybe a more pragmatic approach is coming um, after the dismissal of Bannon and others, uh, deals with the Democrats on the debt ceiling uh, and other things. But regardless, uh, it still will remain uh, necessary for uh, more serious intellectuals to better develop this agenda, as well as more credible politicians to champion it. And I think, um, again, what we have, what a, what a lot of people have missed, especially in the American media, and these sort of personality conflicts that go on in our politics is how much of this is driven by the underlying economic and other conditions. And as long as those issues do not change, then um, what has been called Trumpism will remain popular uh, and it will be possible for someone uh, more intelligent, more serious uh, to develop it into potentially a, a very successful uh, political agenda and maybe even a, a successful governing agenda. The first thing, and I think the, um, uh, really from the perspective of the right, the essential fact that needs to be recognized as a result of this is that the conservative movement, as it has been called, the movement of Bill Buckley and Ronald Reagan, a fusion of sort of libertarian economics with uh, social conservatism and sort of uh, foreign policy hawkishness and interventionism. This the dominance of this movement in the Republican Party, I think, is effectively over. That's how Trump won the election anyway. And beyond that, it's more or less intellectually bankrupt. Uh, as I said, most of its core economic theories have really been discredited um, by events. Uh, and at this point, even its own members don't really even believe in them. Um, I think perhaps the greatest sign of its decline is the fact that despite holding more offices than at any time since the 1920s, uh, it actually can't pass any of its uh, proclaimed legislative agenda. Uh, and even many, many uh, former senior Republican Party officials have basically admitted that they don't really believe in the things that they have spent years campaigning on, such, such as the repeal of Obamacare, et cetera. So with, with that, uh, movement that has dominated right-wing politics in the U.S. now being eclipsed, I think there is a, still a question, um, a very troubling question, of what comes after it. Uh, on the one hand, it could be a movement toward a right-wing identitarian politics, um, as you're seeing with the so-called alt-right, etc. I think this would be a very troubling uh, and terrible development for everybody. Uh, and on the other side, the other option is some kind of renewed sense of the American political community, uh, American citizenship, um, the primary focus of which would have to be to make uh, the nation state and citizenship more uh, meaningful, more significant, uh, both culturally and I think especially uh, economically. Um, as has been mentioned, this is, is more or less my project, uh, which, effective, which hasn't been particularly effective in influencing the administration, um, but I think it has gained some momentum uh, with certain intellectuals. As for the left, I think there are basically three alternatives. The first is the combination of leftist identity politics and sort of oligarchical uh, neoliberalism, which is what it, it more or less represents now but I think that this combination is already being cannibalized um, from within. The second option would be a return to a basically an outright avowed aspiration for a sort of global communism. I, I think this is impractical and not uh, particularly desirable, but it retains uh, some influence among parts of uh, the left uh, intellectual community, I think you could potentially see uh, a sort of uh, 
Bernie Sanders was not this, but you could maybe see someone coming out of that movement that would, would, would go back to this. Um, and it is at least logically consistent, which the present left is not. And I think finally the other alternative would be a return to the sort of progressive nationalism um, in which the traditional left concerns on economic and social justice issues are regrounded and integrated within the larger sense of national citizenship. Um, and to some extent this is emerging. We've seen it uh, with prominent American intellectuals like Mark Lilla, Fareed Zakaria, Peter Beinart and others um, actually arguing for compromise and moderation on even very controversial issues such as identity politics and immigration. Um, and I certainly think that this uh, movement um, is really the only practical alternative. And I think that combined with a refined, a redefined and more sensible right politics could actually form a new center and a new political consensus um, that could, um, could, uh, could really dominate American politics um, for, for the next generation or so uh, and potentially could, uh, would look to reverse um, a lot of the uh, changes and decline um, and, and other problems that we are currently faced with uh, both economically uh, and internationally. And I at least think that is the um, most uh, likely best hope for the future. Thank you. Well, good evening. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this distinguished university. It's a great honor. I uh, wish I hadn't flown from Berlin yesterday because I'm perhaps not as alert as I would like to be, but I will try to give you um, some useful thoughts anyway. Uh, Mr. Krein, I think very uh, brilliantly outlined some developments in American political society and uh, gave a very interesting overview of where the country may be headed, mostly in terms of domestic politics. So what I'll try to do now is talk more about where our foreign policy is and may be going as some of these trends work their way out. Um, the first thing I think to understand about American foreign policy right now is just what a strange situation we are in. You know, after World War I, the United States had a great debate about what we should do later. And Woodrow Wilson wanted to go in one direction, the Republican Party wanted to go in another, Wilson lost, the Republicans won, the United States did not join the League of Nations and otherwise pursued a, set of, a, a, a coherent, if not always successful, set of policies. After World War II, we had not one, but two debates. The first one in 1945 and 1946, what do we do after World War II? Most Americans just wanted to come home and the U.S. had demobilized more than 90% of the military forces used during the war. Um, but then as Stalin began to threaten Western Europe more, and as both in Japan and in Western Europe, economic conditions continued to worsen after the war, the United States had another debate. And as a result of that debate, the United States entered into the Cold War competition with the Soviet Union that lasted until about 1989. When the Cold War ended, we did not have a debate. The United States, without, without a lot of argument, President George H.W. Bush called for the establishment of a new world order. And the idea was that the, that the economic system and the political systems that had grown up in what people called the free world during the Cold War, they would simply be extended into developing countries on the one hand and into the formerly socialist countries on the other, much in the way that after the end of the Cold War, West Germany absorbed East Germany. It extended 
its policies, and its economic system into the East. This is a very ambitious program to transform the world. At the time, I think the American leadership who um, embraced this ideal were under the impression that actually this wouldn't be so difficult to do. Now that the Soviet Union was no longer resisting market capitalism and dem liberal democracy, these forces would simply move almost on their own. Maybe a little technical assistance from the Americans here, maybe a little bit of financial pressure here, maybe a little diplomacy over here, but that this was, history was over and we were simply moving to a, to a comfortable, safe harbor. We can't say, looking back over the last 25 years, 27 years, that this policy was a complete failure, or rather that it had no effects. Never in the history of the world have so many people emerged from absolute poverty as, has been, as, as we've seen since the end of the Cold War. Um, we've seen de rapid declines in infant mortality. We've seen the spread of the benefits, sometimes the questionable benefits, of industrial civilization to places that had never enjoyed these opportunities before. Millions, billions of people have greater access to the world through smartphones, through the internet, through greater literacy. This has not been a time when the world has stood still. But, and I think this is, this is part of what my colleague, Mr. Krein, was pointing to. These were, in a sense, abstract triumphs for humanity as a whole. Their relationship to the national interest, as many Americans might understand that, was a little more questionable. Great. A lot of people in China and Mexico now have better jobs than they did 20 years ago. I don't have a better job. In fact, I don't have a job. An American with thinking in this way might say, what kind of foreign policy is this? Really, they're using my tax dollars to export my job? to promote the development of an international system which reduces my standard of living? They're really going to do this? So we didn't have that debate. Today, I think we're having it. I think the election of 2016 saw the, the, the victory of a president who questioned some of the basic founding assumptions of American foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. Um, this d was not, it should not have been such a surprise to people, it didn't really come out of nowhere. If you think about it, in 1992, we had an election between George H.W. Bush, the victor in the Cold War, the designer of the New World Order, against Bill Clinton a governor from, a, from uh, uh, the state of Arkansas with no international experience to speak of, no, no government experience beyond the state level, and the American people voted, in, voted Clinton in and Bush out. In 2008, we had an election, well, in 2000, we had the election between Al Gore, statesman, future Nobel Prize winner, experienced player at the national level, and George W. Bush, no international experience. Again, Bush beats Gore. 2008, John McCain, a great man of the United States with deep roots in foreign policy, an understanding of the complexities of foreign policy, and Barack Obama, a first-term senator from Illinois with no foreign policy experience and with the idea that maybe we should have a less ambitious foreign policy. And Obama wins. 
So it shouldn't be such a complete surprise that in 2016, we have an experienced Secretary of State who's lived at the top of American politics for 20 years, and she loses to an outsider with no real foreign policy experience. So I think the American people had been signaling their doubts about this post-1990 foreign policy for a long time, and the political establishment wasn't paying attention. And now with President Trump's election, the signal is, is, is unmistakable. If we, I think we can learn a lot about our current situation if we look back at the last great debate that Americans had about foreign policy, the great debate that ended with the adoption of the Marshall Plan and the American commitment to manage a global strategy to contain the Soviet Union. Um, some of you have, are, are familiar with the typology in American foreign policy that I've used, and apologies now for referring to my own work. But if you want to understand the way American foreign policy works, you need to, you need to understand that there are, there are four basic schools of thought about how American foreign policy should work. Two of them are what we might call globalist or universal schools that see the natural purpose of American foreign policy as the construction of a world order. The Hamiltonians, and I've named this school for Alexander Hamilton long before he was the star of a successful Broadway show. Um, so, you know, I was for Hamilton when he wasn't even hip. Uh, but uh, Alexander Hamilton thought that the United States could prosper best at home and abroad by imitating in some ways Britain's strategy of close connections between the federal government, the banking system, and large business, global trade protected by a strong navy, and that over time this could allow the United States to replace Great Britain as the center of the global economic and therefore political system. Uh, the Wilsonian school, the second school, also globalist, agrees with the Hamiltonians about the need for world order, but sees a different path to achieving it, more through human rights and international law because what is the cause of war? The cause of war is bad governance and tyranny and lack of democracy. If the world becomes democratic, the world will become peaceful, America will become safe. And so Wilsonians seek to construct a world order on the foundation of principles, rights, and institutions. Now the Hamiltonian and Wilsonian uh, agendas sometimes come into conflict, a classic example, should we promote trade with China or should, and ignore human rights, or should we push China on human rights even if that causes problems for our trade agenda? That would set Hamiltonians and Wilsonians into some kind of conflict, but on many things they can agree. Our Cold War consensus, um, that President Truman helped to form in the 1940s included both of these schools, but also another school, the Jacksonian School. Jacksonians are not globalist. They are not motivated by the hope of building a new world order. They're not sure they believe in such things. They're not missionaries like the Wilsonians who think that Everyone everywhere must live in a democracy just as we do in the United States. Um, they think maybe a lot of people in the world aren't ready for democracy or interested in democracy. And in any case, it isn't America's business or shouldn't be America's business to tell everybody else around the world how to live. Um, so they are also suspicious of the Hamiltonian agenda because they know that very often when big business and big government come together, uh, what happens is not necessarily good for the little guy. 
and that corrupt partnerships, crony capitalism, and other things happen. And so they see the Hamiltonian program in a way as a kind of an invitation to standing corruption. And in both cases, they see the Hamiltonians and Wilsonians as elites who want to impose their views on the population at large, and they resist that. Jacksonians believe that the United States should live and let live in international affairs unless we are attacked or our allies are attacked. And Jacksonians, when you have, when you have an attack, Jacksonians go from not caring about foreign policy to being very focused on the need to punish the attackers, destroy the attacker's will and ability to attack the United States again. So after, before 9-1-1, there were very few people in the United States who thought that a war in Afghanistan made any sense whatever. After 9-1-1, it was impossible to resist the pull to war, and even some years later into Iraq. Uh, so the Jacksonians go, can go from being not at all interested in foreign policy to being very focused on it. In 1947, Harry Truman understood that while the Wilsonians and the Hamiltonians were right, that the best way to contain the Soviet Union was to promote the development of a free world that was economically prosperous and oriented at least to some degree toward human rights and liberty, and that this would be the basis for alliances in Europe and in Asia that could contain the danger. Um, he also understood that Jacksonians, who he needed for this, for this struggle, would not, would not respond. Oh, let's be like Britain and build a world system and let's let the Federal Reserve be the new Bank of England and let's have the United States Navy do what the Royal Navy used to do. No public support for that. Let's promote human rights around the world and, and fight tyranny and send American troops to make sure that other people can live in democracy. Again, not a lot of support for this idea. But Communism is a danger to the United States. They are trying to destroy our way of life. If we don't stop them there, we'll have to fight them here. Yes. And Jackson, the Cold War coalition was Hamiltonians and Wilsonians and Jacksonians. Jeffersonians tend to be the more isolationist group, and we can talk about them during the the next part of the session if you'd like, but I'm, I'm going to leave that aside for now. So again, if we look at 1990, what happened is when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Jacksonians lost interest in the New World Order. They were not, they did not see the point of trying to make the whole world democratic, and they, and they were suspicious that some of these ideas of free trade and the WTO and NAFTA might actually benefit corporate interests and hurt ordinary Americans. So again in 1990, the Wilsonian and Hamiltonian elites decided not to worry about that because they didn't think that the United States, that the government was going to need to pursue foreign policies that would require this kind of strong support. Now gradually, in the 1990s, it, it looked for a while as if that was reasonable. I mean, you know, Kosovo did not require, no American was killed in Kosovo. The Gulf, the first Gulf War looked like a tremendous success and, and you know, I'll have a war in the Gulf and I'll make Japan pay for it. Uh, it kind of worked. Other countries actually helped contribute to the cost of that war and it wasn't a big war, and when it was over, we left. So it looked as if it might work, but gradually things got tougher. Um, after 9-1-1, not only 
Was it tougher, but the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq didn't seem to be going well. It didn't, the, the, there didn't seem to be any good Wilsonian plans to save the Middle East through spreading democracy or Hamiltonian plans to get rid of terrorism by making the Middle East prosperous. None of it really seemed to work. Um, then on top of that, Russia and China began to behave in more threatening ways. It was clear that neither of those countries any longer saw and had an interest in becoming democratic with the Russian attacks on Georgia and then Crimea, with China building islands in the South China Sea, with nuclear programs in North Korea and Iran. The world was getting more dangerous. Foreign policy was clearly going to require more energy, but the case had never been made to Jacksonian America that this new world order policy made sense to them. And so this in a way is the debate that we're having now in the United States and it's reflected very much in the politics of the Trump administration. Um, what is our goal? Are we trying to democratize the world? Are we trying to denuclearize the world? Why does America have so many troops in so many countries? Why do we spend all this money on Europe when all the Europeans ever do is criticize us for either doing too much or too little? Is it really America's business to protect Japan from North Korea even as North Korea is building missiles to someday reach the United States. Why, 50 years after the Korean War, does the United States still have troops in South Korea? So these questions are circulating. The elites have gotten out of the habit of trying to make, you know, bridge the gap between the way they think and maybe the way the average person thinks. And so we saw during the election campaign, uh, Mr. Trump, as he was then, shocked the elites by saying, well, I'll tell you, the goal of American foreign policy should be America first. And for elites, they look at this and they say, oh, this is terrible. This is what Charles Lindbergh said in the 1940s when he was trying to keep the U.S. out of the war against Hitler, this is neo-Nazi, that Trump, we can tell he's a Nazi, he's a fascist, all right, all of these things. But to the average person who had not studied the intricacies of American pol political history in the 1940, it was obvious common sense. Yes, of course, America first. You know, they would think, yes, and the prime minister of Japan should think Japan first. You know, there's, why does a democracy elect somebody and give it their highest office so that that person will do everything possible to make the voters, make the nation prosperous and, and, and safe? Why would anybody object to such an obvious common sense idea? Do you think America should be second, third, fourth, fifth? And this conversation, I think, helped illustrate just how far, how wide a gap had opened between a foreign policy establishment that was succeeding at some things, failing at other things, but had lost an ability to communicate, and a public which was looking at a world that seemed less and less like the world it was told to expect after 1990. You told me I would have an end of history. You told me there would be no problems. You told me that we could solve terrorism by solving the problems of terror, but the causes of terrorism, spreading democracy and economic growth in the Middle East. You don't know how to do either one of those things. <coughs> and so here we are. I think Mr. Kreis is absolutely right to make the point that 
the establishments of both parties don't have answers for some of the most important problems that we face. What do you do about a North Korea? This is not an easy thing. It's very difficult to see an approach that doesn't lead to something terrible. Uh, what do you do about Russia in Crimea? What do you do about the situation in the Middle East, if anything? There aren't, this is, this is typical of world history, by the way, when there aren't good, obvious, easy answers to international problems. That is the way human history normally works. But at the moment in the United States, we don't have a consensus about what to do, and we, our elites seem to be less and less capable of, or, of developing a debate and a conversation and an approach that can command support. I don't think this will last forever. Uh, I don't think we've reached the end of the line, but I do think we're at a new and an interesting stage. Mr. Krein talked about some of the options that are open. I'll tell you what I hope we will see. I hope we will see a new kind of politician who understands the global situation well, sees linkages between American interests and those of allies and others abroad, can think constructively about ways to meet the challenges, but also understands the way the American people think, the Jack of Jacksonian America thinks, knows how to connect with those people, and knows how to make a solid, honest case for American foreign policy that resonates well with the bulk of the American people. This won't solve our, all of our problems, but it's the basis for a solution. Anyway, thank you very much for listening so attentively. あの、それともあの、それ以上のものなのかというようなことが多分今日あの議論されたと思うんですけども、あの、我々日々その<笑> あの、いうことではなくて、あの、むしろその適応することをあの、国家、そしてま、国民レベルも含めて選んだんじゃないのかなと。で、不安はありつつもその適応するしかないということについては、あの、合意があるように思います。ま、だからこそこういうその進歩順も開
、今このどういうこの行動、あの構造的な変動が起きているのかっていうことが。まあ、なかなかその見えにくくなっているということだろうと思うんですけどもあのまあこれがその一家的なものなのかそれとも大きな変化の潮流なのか、まあ、実態はそのミックスということなんだろうと思いますが、まあ、今日のお二人の話で、まあ、おぼろげながらです、ね、トランプ現象の中核にあるようなものがあの見えてきたことなのかなというふうに思っていますであのそのお二人の,あのお話を伺うと全体としてはまあ悪くない方向に向かっているというような響きもその感じられましたし、もしくはこのトランプ現象というのは、ある種の,この必然性さえ伴っているんだというそのご説明であったかと思います。で、まあ、これからそのアメリカは、まあ、ある種の、まあ、ナショナリズムというのは非常に多義的な言葉なんで、あのナショナリズムという言葉を用いてそのあの、トランプ現象を説明されましたけれども、必ずしもそれがはっきり見えてきたようにはあの感じられないんですけれども、まあ、いずれにせよ、その今の喧騒にあの惑わされるなというお話だったかと思います。で特に、あのミード先生の方から、まあ、あの驚くなと、92年以来、ずっとアメリカはメッセージをその送り続けてきたんだというふうなそのご説明を聞いて、なるほどなというふうに思い,ます思いましたし。あのまあ冷戦時代の,そのアメリカの,このグローバルコミットというのが、むしろその異例の事態だったということも非常にあの強く納得しました。で、私自身がちょっと最近あの考えていることをあの短くお話しさせていただきますと、まあ、あのトランプ大統領はそのオバマ大統領との,この対比で、あの全くそのあの対極のものとしてあの語られることが多いように思うんですけれども、私はむしろそこの連続性っていうのを、まあ、あえて見てもいいのかなという感じがしてます。で、オバマ大統領はあの2015年にあの国家安全保障戦略、ナショナルセキュリティストラテジーという文書をその出しましたけどもその、その戦略文書の中で、オバマ大統領は、事実上、このアメリカの衰退を認めて、まあ、それをこのドクトリン化しようとしたという、ある意味私は非常に歴史的な文書だったと思うんですけども、でその認識を受けて、オバマ大統領というのは、まあ、アメリカを世界に適応させようとしたと、言ってみれば、そのグローバリズムの言葉でアメリカの役割を語ろうとしたというのがオバマ大統領だったと思うんですね。で、トランプ大統領の場合、まだあの国家安全保障戦略、出してないですけれども、まあ、今までの,その,この彼の発言をその総合すると、まあ、彼の認識の中にもやっぱりアメリカというのは衰退しつつあるんだ。そういうその認識ははっきりあるんだろうと思うんですね。で、その衰退しつつある状況をナショナリズムの言葉で語ろうとしたっていうのがあのトランプなのかなという感じがしてます。で、確かにこのアメリカファーストっていうのはそのアメリカングレートネスっていうのを目指し思考しているんですけども、その背景にはあの衰退の認識がまあかなりはっきり伺えると。で、つまりオバマ大統領もトランプその大統領もまあ、アメリカおかしいことになっていると、ただ、それを若干違った方法であの意味付けたということなんだろうと思うんですけれども、この2人の,この外形的なメッセージがあまりに違うので、あの見えにくくなっているんですが、まあ、私はそのトランプとオバマの間には、先ほど申し上げた連続性があるというふうに考えているんですけれども、つまり、突き詰めていくと、トランプ大統領が言っていることというのは、もう無駄な介入はやらないということですよね、それが1つ。それからこの同盟国やパートナーにもっとこの強く要求していこうということで、3番目が国内にフォーカスするということだと思うんですけども、これ、実はオバマと全く同じなんですね、言ってることが。<笑>でそう考えますと、あの今起きていることっていうのは、実はやっぱりトランプであの突然起きたことではなくて、やっぱりこの中期的に進行している事態の、もしかするとこの表彰なのかもしれないと。であのアメリカのこの自己イメージっていうのがこのように大きくその変動しているんだとすると、やっぱりこれは日本のような国にとっては、まあ、長期的に見て非常に深刻な事態だということがあの言えるのかもしれないと思います。で、トランプ政権が発足してから、このリベラル・インターナショナル・オーダーっていうのは、なんか汚れたような言葉にあのなってしまいましたけれども。あの先ほどそのクライン先生からもミード先生の方からもお話がありましたように、まあ、アメリカ人というのはこれまでこのリベラル・インターナショナル・オーダーというのをこのフルにサポートしたことというのはあんまりなかったんじゃないかと
。で、実は私あの一昨日サウスダコタあ一昨日まであのサウスダコタってのは実はクライン先生の出身の州でもあるんですけども、サウスダコタに行ってリベラルインターナショナルオーダーの重要性でその中における日米同盟の重要性っていうのをあの語ってきたんですが。まあ、正直に言って、そんなものにこの普段から関心を持っている人というのは、まあ、当然のことながらあのいないわけですよね。ただ、やっぱりこれまでのアメリカは、そういうこのアメリカの無関心をまあ押し返す、ある種、このまあエスタブリッシュメントなり、知的リーダーというのがいたわけですけれども、あのまあ今やそれがいないということなんだろうと思います。であのでさらにこの、まあ、あの今回の選挙の結果に引きつけて、まあ、もしあのクリントンだったら、サンダースだったら、まあ、両方の,その候補者のもとでも TPP というのはだめだったでしょうし、共和党の方を見ても、まあ、ルビオでもクルーズでも、パリ協定は厳しかったでしょうし、イランとの核合意というのもかなり危なかったということを見ますと、実はトランプ現象というのは、確かにツイッターとか、あの大統領のキャラクターとかという意味では、非常にこの突飛な現象かもしれないですが、構造変動という意味で言いますと、実はそんなにトランプというのは、トランプ現象というのは、キーなものではないのかなということで、冷静に見なければいけないということをです、ね、お二人のお話を聞きながら、えっと、強くあの感じたところです。で、あのお二人にあの質問をこれからさせていただきたいと思いますが、まあ、ただ、フロアからもたくさん質問があると思うんで、直接今答えてもらうというよりもあのフロアからの答えの中に適宜私の答えをその混ぜてあのいただければと思いますがあの、まあ、お二人にあの質問はまずそのオバマとトランプの連続性についてちょっとどう思うかということもしご意見があればお伺いしたいということとあともう一つ、まあ、どうしてもやっぱりあのバノンに過剰反応するなというお話があったかと思うんですがあのやっぱりバノンがまあ抜けてでバノンはある意味、トランプ革命の,そのソウルみたいなところがあったと思うんですけれども、やっぱりこれをもってそのトラ、いわゆるトランプ革命っていうのは終わったというふうに考えていいのかというのは、これがあのお二人の質問で、であと、その個々にまたあのご質問をさせていただきますと、あのクラインさんにはです、ねあの、そのアメリカン・アフェアーズという雑誌をまあ創刊されて、でも私も、あの相田さんも、この相田先生も、この知識人が集まってトランプ思想をこの肯定しようとしているっていう、その行為にまあびっくりしたわけですけれども、実はその、まあ、今からもうえと50年以上前に、60年なんですが、あのバックリーという人が、ナショナルレビューという雑誌を30歳で創刊して、まあ、保守主義運動をあのまああの知的にサポートしようとして。でまさにあのク,ラインクライン先生も非常に若くて、あの雑誌を創刊されてで、さらにお話の中で、もう保守議運動は終わったとで、さらっと言われましたけども、これ、非常にショッキングな発言なんだろうと思うんですよね。やはりこのアメリカン・アフェアーズっていう媒体を使って、やっぱり保守主義運動がこれまで埋めていたで、それがなくなったんだとすると、その空白を何らかの形で埋めようっていう、そういうこの大きなこの野心なり、野望なりがあるのかと。ただ他方で、もともとそのトランプをサポートするという目的で創刊された雑誌なわけですけれども、一月ほど前ですか、シャロッツビルの直後だと思いますけれども、あのクラインさん自身はトランプと決別するというこのコラムをです、ね、ニューヨーク・タイムズに書かれたかと思いますが、そのエディトリアルボードの中で、やっぱりこの方向性をめぐるいろんな議論があったのか。アメリカンアフェアーズの今後の方向性みたいなことが、ちょっとその、あのお話、そのシェアしていただけることがありましたら、まあ、ぜひあの聞いてみたいというふうに思います。で、ミード先生の方にはですね、あの今から、えっと、1年半ぐらい前でしょうか、NHK ワールドの仕事であの討論番組がありまして、えっと、ニューヨークでご一緒させていただいたかと思うんですけれども、その時はあは、もうちょっとですね、このトランプ政権というのに、批判的だったような私は印象を受けたんですね。で、あのそのタイポロジーの,あのお話をして、まあ、日本でも非常によくその知られているタイポロジーですけれども、このタイポロジーっていうのは、私はあの4つが常に併存しているっていうことなんだろうと思うんです、アメリカ外交の中には。で、その時期によってどれかが非常に強くなったり弱くなったりするっていうことで、例えば、ある特定の政権がこのハミルトニアンだとか。あるあのま,また他の別の政権がウィルソニアンだというわけではなくて、この4つがどういう形で併存しているかということなんだろうと思うんですけれども、今のトランプ政権の問題というのは、やっぱりジャクソニアンがドミナントになりすぎていて、
他の3つがもう完全にこの背後に退いてしまっていることにあるんじゃないかというような私は感じがしますであの、まあ、トランプがそのジャクソニアンをこのやば引っ張り出してきたことについてあの、まあ、ともするとこの肯定的にあの評価しているようなニュアンスもあったかと思うんですけどもその今のジャクソニアンというのはどうもその壁を作る、まあ、象徴的に言いますと壁を作ることにしかまあ関心がないようにともすると外からあの見てると見受けられると。であの現在のやっぱり国際政治っていうのはあの拳を振り上げて単にそれを振り下ろ,と下ろすっていう話ではなくてでむしろその国際政治の最前線っていうのはある種の闘争の最前線っていうのはルール作りだったりもしくはこの経済行為によってある種の,この勢力圏を作っていくっていう、まあ、TPP なんかもそうだと思うんですけどもでそういうことにこのジャクソニアンっていうのは果たして対応できるかっていうことを考えますと。どうもできなないいんじゃないのかなとでさらにあの昔の状況と違いますのはやっぱりこの世界のつながり方の深度っていうのがやっぱりこ,のこれまでにない規模で進んでいて主権国家体系でありつつもそして地政学の復権っていうことがありつつもですねやはりナショナリズムっていうのが今のアメリカが直面している状況に対する回答だっていうふうには私は少なくともなかなか<笑>思えないんですねですから世界をアメリカの国民がどのように認識しているかという説明としてはよく分かったんですけどもアメリカ外交の指針としての説明にはなってないような気がしたんですがこの点について何らかの形での,そのハミルトニアンとウィルソニアンの,この押し返しがあるのかどうかでさらに最後ですけどもその,そのハミルトニアンとかウィルソニアンというのはなんかどうも国務省みたいな役人にたくさんいたりシンクタンクみたいなところにたくさんいるんだろうと思うんですけども、まあ、今もともとアメリカの特にその保守派の間では国務省不信というのが非常に強く人も全然アポイントされていなく場合によってはその国務省の崩壊なんていうことが言われるようなことがありますけどもこれはやっぱアメリカ外交にとって良きことなのかその辺についてお伺いしたいのと最後本当に最後。えっと、ジャクソニアン、同盟大丈夫だっていうお話ありましたけれども、本当にそうなのかっていうのが、どうしてもあ,のあるんだろうと思うんですね、でそのソ連のような、やっぱり本当にこのグローバルな規模のチャレンジについては、このアメリカ、同盟国をが攻撃されたときに力でもって押し返すっていうのは分かるんですけれども、やっぱり今の、例えば中国のようなチャレンジっていうのは、この危機であると同時にチャンスでもあるっていう、その両方が併存しているような脅威に対して、この同盟国を守るということで本当にジャクソニアンが力を行使するのかということについてどうしても日本の側に不安があるということなんですね。なんでその辺についてもし何かあればあのお話を伺いたいということでとりあえず私の方からは以上とさせていただきます。中山先生ありがとうございました。あの大変、えー、よくまとまった今の状況説明になっておりましたし、えー、質問も極めてあの深い、えー、意義のある質問がいくつか出されたと思います。あの今の話でやっぱり一つ面白いのは。あの衰退論の問題がああの出てきてましたけれども、あの今、オルトライトって呼ばれる、まあ、オルタナ右翼ですか、彼らの問題がこの間のシャーロッツビルなどの事件で、えーえー、突然焦点になってきたわけですが、あのグループの人たちの中核的な、まあ、あの思想を紡ぐジャーナリスト、マイロ・ヤノプロスというのがおるんですけれども、彼の分析によれば、アメリカの新しいそのオルトライト、オルタナ右翼を動かしている根源的なその思想の力は、実はシュペングラーの西方の没落、あそこに原点があるんだと、われわれはあそこからこう突き動かされているんだと、これはなかなか面白いことで。またあのミド先生も何度かおっしゃってるんですけど、やっぱりアメリカには反復的に、まあ、衰退論が起きてくるという、そういうようなこともあります、まあ、そういうことも踏まえながら、その衰退論の問題もあの中山先生から提起されましたけれども、えー、とりあえずそれでは、あの今、中山先生から出た話を、まずじゃあ、ミドさんからあの回答を。していただけないでしょうか。どうですか。お願いいたします。Well, thank you.、Um, very interesting questions. 
Uh, I think in some ways it really comes down to perhaps the largest, deepest historical question in American foreign policy, which is the relationship of the Jacksonian school mm. to other schools. Um, because the Jacksonians, while they are weaker at elite levels, you certainly won't find many Jacksonians in the State Department. There are maybe more atheists in foxholes than there are <laughs> Jacksonians in the State Department. Uh, but on the other hand, um, there are certain things that, that can't work without them. Uh, the American security guarantees would be essentially worthless if we didn't have a Jacksonian public that was willing to vote for large military appropriations and enlist and serve in the armed forces and when in the armed forces to train to fight as opposed to train to make beautiful parades. So you, it, it, for a power like the United States, you cannot be successful without Jacksonians. If the United States had lost the Second World War, no one would have been interested in beautiful Wilsonian ideas about a United Nations or in Hamiltonian ideas about a global trading system. So you cannot live without the Jacksonians, but sometimes it feels that you can't live with them either. And always in politics, I think the essential thing is balance. In politics, the situation is constantly changing in the world outside. The domestic world is in constant flux. The political leader has to figure out how to match the, in, the internal policy with the external policy. I've written that the, um, for a great American president, the four schools of foreign policy thought are like the four strings of a violin. <clears throat> and a great president knows how to, how to produce the music he needs by blending the different strings and using each one for its place. And I think this is the task. Um, for too long, I think, we neglected the Jacksonian string and created a sense of alienation and distrust. And whatever ideas they raised, everyone else said, oh, go away, be quiet, you're ignorant, you're backward. And so, but the Jacksonians noticed, again, that all the predictions about universal peace and prosperity that the Wilsonians and Hamiltonians made in 1990 weren't coming true. So to say that the Jacksonians are sometimes wrong in their overstress on nationalism is correct, but it's also true that Wilsonians and Hamiltonians are wrong because they become too utopian. And somehow you have to make a balance out of things that don't wish to balance each other. That's leadership. And this, I think, is, is something that in America, as in other countries, we need. But our guarantees would be worthless if we didn't have Jacksonians. But if we only had Jacksonians, we might not make any guarantees. Balance. Balance. How about Crane's son? Um, so I don't want to f spend too much time on the um, sort of personal uh, questions because um, they don't really matter much, but uh, in general, uh, yes, I think like, um, as with Buckley in 1955, uh, who saw a, a need for a new intellectual response to what was going on in the world, um, I think we have uh, reached a similar point now, um, oddly enough, or maybe ironically enough, precisely because of the failure and decline of Buckley's own movement. Uh, and I guess I would, I would, you know, it's, it's um, with respect to the position of American affairs in general, um, not to get too far into the details of U.S. law in the magazine, but this, it was never started 
as an organ for Trump. Uh, it was always a nonprofit organization. I think if anyone reads it, you will see that it is, not, you know, there's, it, it's about much deeper policy issues and items, and there's been plenty of things in it that are critical of Trump. Uh, and, and that's fundamentally what I have always uh, cared most about. Um, I have at times defended Trump uh, and some of his uh, proposals. Um, and after Charlottesville uh, and actually the long running and accumulating failures of the administration after seven months, uh, I wrote an op-ed um, explaining my disapproval. Um, but fundamentally, my position on the core policies have not, has not changed at all, uh, and the magazine has not changed at all. Um, uh, I Editorial board on Naka, the no discussion. What about the question on this uh, debate inside the editorial board? Every everyone affiliated with the uh, magazine was uh, in full agreement with uh, what we did. Ma, today's discussion, de, ano, nakanaka ima America de nani ga okite ru ka tsukamae nikui tokoro ga arimasu ga, ma, ano, amari ni mo chotto o o zappa na matome na ru kamoshi nasen kado. やっぱ大きなその転換期、え、ま、トランスフォーマティブっていうか、こう形が変わっていく大きな時期に今アメリカ入ってる。え、で、また日本もあの、そのアメリカの動きとともに当然のことながらあ、それに巻き込まれざる